Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sensei Podcast. It is a great pleasure to introduce our guest today, which is Dr. Rastem Dautov from uh, Brisbane, Australia, where he heads the complex PCI and uh, CTO program at the King Charles Hospital. Um, Rastem, again, it's been, we know each other for a long time. It's a pleasure to have you today as a guest of the podcast. Thank you, Manos. Uh, great to see you as usual. Uh, maybe one day it will be King Charles, but at the moment it's still Prince Charles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just renamed it a little bit, I guess, right? So, sorry for that. Yeah. Um, I think you are in the uh, correct track, yeah. Forward-looking, forward-looking. So, so, so Rastam, tell me a little bit about your journey. I know that, um, you know, you've been through um, a lot of training, one of the first uh, complex fellows ever, and you've created a phenomenal program. How did this all start for you? When did you start to decide you're going to do complex and CTO PCI? Um, I was uh, doing training in Adelaide. Uh, it was just a usual cardiology training where um, at some point you have to decide where you go. Uh, the main streams, obviously, you know, one of them is interventional. So I, I was really interested in that and I was never sure if it's something for me because I, I never wanted, for example, to do a surgery. And then it happened um, that um, I just made the decision to go to Montreal Interventional Symposium. This is annual event um, in Montreal. Uh, similar, I guess, to TCC, some kind of version. And um, I was looking at the lectures, listening, and um, I really was impressed uh, by chronic total occlusion session where Stefan Rinfred was presenting. Um, I looked into that area even before and I did some presentations uh, because it was quite new area for, for Australia. And then I had a good conversation to Stefan and um, he offered me a fellowship position, but he said it's um, first of all unpaid, and second, it's a CCO fellowship. I, I was so happy to, to to join that. So that that happened uh, two years later, uh, 2014. I started. I had two years to uh, study French because it was a requirement, and um, it was enough time for me to finish my PhD um, in Adelaide with uh, John Horowitz, who was um, uh, my mentor for ten years, who made me to become a cardiologist, and. 2014, the journey started in Laval Hospital, that's in Quebec, Quebec City, French hospital, with Stefan. Um, so I um, did all the cases with Stefan as his only fellow because there were like a total of eight fellows in the program, but only one CTO fellow. Um, first few months, I was just scrubbing with him, watching. And in fact, those two years from 12 to 14, when I was already kind of waiting for my fellowship. I did a lot of reading, studied algorithms, uh, watched everything possible, uh, available. You know, the, the, it was a very fast growing field, changing a lot. And um, the first few months I was just, you know, applying this theoretical knowledge I had and see what Stefan was doing. He was explaining every case we prepared in advance. So it was a really good school for me. And then- Did you um, understand correctly that you learned French? to go to work like you didn't know French before? I didn't know French before, but the French goes even uh, a bit early before I met Stefan. I started to study French half a year before I met Stefan in Montreal uh, because, um, you know, I come from a different background and um, I always thought Canada is a good spot. Uh, one of the, my mentors, Andrew Philpot from Adelaide, who came from Canada, convinced me to look into Canada because you don't have to sit to SMLE. It's a public system. Every patient is yours, you know. And um, I started studying French, uh, thinking I don't have to compete with uh, applicants in Toronto General and Vancouver General. Maybe I'll go to that area. And, and in fact, I also applying in France and uh, there was some good emails from Toulouse. Um, uh, but that, then I, I got to, to meet Stefan. So then I, uh, once I met Stefan with this offer, I just accelerated this. I had so many things happening in French. Uh, we had even families uh, staying, staying uh, with us many times with, from France, uh, couch surfing, you know. 
um, on condition speaking French. I attended Alliance Francaise. So uh, it was very fast journey over two years. And um, uh, I was very happy with that because Quebec City, uh, where Stefan was working, not many applicants would consider. It would be only Belgian, a few French and Spanish. Um, you know, you have to speak French. Uh, and in fact, it's not about the center, it's about your mentor. That's the key. Then Stefan left for Montreal and then to Atlanta, Georgia. And obviously fellow target him rather than applicants target him rather than the center where he was. It's so important. And in, in, another important thing is in, in my case where Stefan offered me a uh, city of fellowship, I was um, kind of a new experiment because um, before coming to Montreal, uh, to, to Quebec City, I have never done a single PCI of any sort of type. You know, when in Adelaide, uh, I was training in, in Queen Elizabeth Hospital for 10 years, we, we didn't have a fellowship program. So the best you could do is just your angiogram. Sometimes I used to do a lot of pacemakers and um, occasionally you would assist one of the interventionists on STEMI, for example, uh, passing a wire and things like that. But, you know, you, you come to a fellowship. I, I was flying via Iceland uh, from visiting my family in Russia and then via Iceland to Canada to my fellowship. And that's on that on that flight. It hit me. Is it something for me? What what will happen if my uh, you know handshake and things like that? You know because I've never done this. And suddenly, like Stefan Rinfred, such a big uh, uh, figure in in the field, uh, huge mentor. He he kind of relying on me. But what what will happen if I fail? This this was somehow like a lightning through my head. But then it went well. You know with with such a mentor. Well, you know, we had uh, many people who learned, uh, you know, City of PCI directly after fellowship. But as far as I know, I think you're the only one who went straight from cardiology to, you know, City of training immediately. So that's obviously a very fast learning curve. But it looks like you were fairly well prepared for this, right? So you studied about it. So you did all the theoretical part before. But how did it feel when you actually started and now you're in the lab and you're doing these cases? So it was a kind of a gradual journey because uh, I would scrap with Stefan all the time with his cases. But when he's not in the lab, I would have another 10 or 11 um, attendings uh, to join. Each of them would have different styles. Some of them with you know, chronic back pain at three months allowed me to do all the cases uh, since I started. That obviously also helped me. But uh, the thing is with Stefan, and uh, that's what I exactly do with my mm -hmm. fellows, he would you know, scrap with you for every even simple case. Because when your mentor consultant standing next to you or doing the case and you're watching, this is the best learning. It's not when attending sitting in the control room and you do things. In that case, you of course, you apply your previous learnings from uh, all other events, but you, you don't learn on the, on the spot. And, um, you know, I, I've seen so many hundreds of cases with Stefan over two and a half years of the fellowship, and I've seen a lot of techniques. And this is kind of after each case, you you discuss again. This is how you remember. This is how it it goes into your you know memory. And then when you have similar cases, you can apply. And I was surprised when I came back. Suddenly, I started to do cases. You know, uh, in the fellowship. You know, you rarely would do A to Z. You would do different different parts each time. And then suddenly you start to do things and it works. Uh, and you realize this all from the teaching of one particular person. And Rastam, what did you find most difficult to learn? You know, obviously you started from press, but were there some things that you found uh, particularly difficult to, to learn during the process? You mean in the fellowship itself? Yeah, in the fellowship while you were doing, or later on as well, like when you learned the complex part, what thing was the hardest, the wires, the thinking, the complications, any specific parts that you found more difficult to understand and learn? Amandus, because it was so gradual from zero, um, over two and a half years, almost every day in the lab, it's, it's gradually, uh, I've seen a lot of um, techniques, complications, how to manage how to stay calm, um, how to, you know, involve the team, how to prepare for the cases, how to avoid things, uh, you know, and how also to teach 
the fellows how to teach um, you know colleagues interested in the job uh, so it was very gradual journey and um, I don't think I remember any major difficulties of course at, at some point when I was moving from Quebec City after one and a half years to Montreal to join uh, Stefan at his new job um, that was kind of a bit of change you know suddenly you join different team and uh, it's now uh, less French, more English. Um, uh, and then you, you start to do Impella cases, which we didn't have in Quebec City. Yeah, maybe that's only a step forward. I think it was the next level because that's why we accelerated and started to do only more uh, complex. Stefan in the, the new job would not do just simple cases. That would be just a collection of only very complex cheap cases. And that's what we did for a year with more cases of City, obviously. And Rustem, how um, did you learn to deal with uh, complications? Was it watching them? Was it thinking about them? Was it reading? What was the best way that you learned from them? What I remember, uh, Dimitri Kampeliotis, when uh, just before I left, he told me uh, I asked for advice. I asked advice from many people, from Bill Lombardi, etc. And he told me, don't do any CTOs for the first three months. That was kind of um, uh, contra to what I was thinking. And that's what I actually did. Um, I didn't do anything complex uh, because everyone is watching you, the surgeons watching you, you know, who is this new guy. And of course, I, I remember when I had the first complication was um, a, a retrograde case and uh, very calcified. It was perforation of the proximal right. And um, uh, surgeons jumped in and uh, they took the patient to hybrid lab. Um, but with the help of echocardiologists um, uh, who convinced them that the it's not progressing rapidly, they allowed me to put a covered stand because, of course, nowadays uh, I do it myself, but those days they didn't allow me to do that because they thought, okay, who is this new guy, you know? So uh, the complications obviously will happen and uh, they happen time to time, but you try to avoid them. It's... Um, First important thing is to avoid them, and second, how you manage them. And because a part of the training uh, was managing complications, and the, the cases Stefan did, they were the, the top, the top, really top um, complexity. And of course, time to time they would happen. And once you go through these complications, being a part of the team, you kind of remember these things. And when they happen to me, uh, kind of. Uh, you know, you manage them. Sometimes you do manage them for the first time. And what I always suggest to my fellows um, uh, as a part of their training is to try to attend complication courses. There are many of them. We have, for example, Action Day in Sydney for one day where, like, so many cases presented uh, from the year. There is a Hong Kong stand where there are many complications. It's happening in March now for two days. And then, then there is a Bill Lombardi uh, complication uh, course in Seattle. So I always try to target those conferences because sometimes you go for the whole day and you find something, single case, that will save you later on because you remember that. Perfect. And then um, you do, since then, you build a great program. You're doing many complex cases right now. Um, how, did, how, did the, how did the transition come between, you know, the training, starting your practice, and now having a high-volume cases? How, how easy or how difficult was that? The... Running complex PCI program uh, requires obviously a few um, components. Uh, the support of the hospital, support of the head of the department, which is, was crucial when I, I started the work because each kind of step in your life uh, leads you to, to the next level. Uh, doing PhD with John Horvitz helped me to, to get to the fellowship with Stefan in Australia. There is no regulations on how many PCI uh, operators should be anyone any fellow and this is very uh, popular now every advanced training cardiology wants to do international cardiology and they will do it they will do it either here in our fellowships or they go overseas come back and there are no jobs and they end up in private i'm full-time in public so um, in public you never th think about where to find patients they're always on your list in private you have to find your patients yourself and when you and you nobody will refer to you so young people will come back from, you know, let's say complex interventions or from structural programs, and they will have two sessions a week in the cat lab. One session is half day, so they will have one day in the cat lab. If if I had something like this, and I had offers to to 
join the biggest uh, private networks full time, then you just scale, you cannot do cases, you just sit in the clinic, generate income for the company, and that's it. So it's very important uh, when you think about complex PCIs to make sure when you come back, you have a good job because the first job is the one that counts the most. When you have access to the lab, you know, sometimes I have six sessions, uh, so it's three full days, um, uh, four, five, it's minimum. um, And I try to do more just complex cases, not avoid simple cases because my list kind of always full. And I always tend to run over time because, again, I need more sessions in the lab. In our specialty, as you know, the more cases you do, the better you become. There is, there is only, you have to have a good foundation. And that foundation was provided to me by Stefan Rintret. And then you have to have a good lab time and good referral base. Without that, people just scale. It's like losing language. It's like with my French, every day I drive, I listen to French radio. Because there are no, nobody to talk to in French. That's the only way not to forget it. Absolutely. I mean, like everything else, right? The more you do, the better it gets. And actually, that's a real problem, having the volume, especially in the U.S. as well, because quite often people start their program and usually don't have the reputation or the referrals. So the first few years, they don't do enough cases. And that's a problem because you don't build very strong skills if you don't do enough cases, especially in these early days. So, Rastam, do you have any favorite book or any favorite movie? Um, I read. I, I used to read a lot um, during uh, early days. Uh, with the cardiology training, it's very demanding, uh, and sometimes I'm very surprised. Like, for example, how my mentor John Horvitz reads everything that's you know in the mainstream, and he knows about everything. Um, you know, the, my work takes time, and, and the, the family <laughs> as much time I can spend with them. Um, uh, recently with uh, my wife and three kids, we, we went uh, camping and we really loved it over three days in the mountains, in the big tent, and we will do more of that. So, but time to time, I, I, I read at the moment, um, recently I've been to proctoring to Uzbekistan and one friend, they gave me a book about um, the Conqueror Timberlane, and I started to read about that. Um, um, uh, my first English book was uh, The Godfather. I bought it in the bookshop in Budapest. I went into the, and saw so many English books. I've never seen this before. It was one of my first trips um, uh, outside. And um, I read that. I came back. I watched the movie. And then, you know, I continued to read. Um, I really loved that. Um, maybe because it was my first English book. That's how I remember that. But I, I loved actually the everything about that. And uh, when I went to New York, I realized it was a, f- a fiction. There is no such an area there. Um, uh, of course, I, I nowadays, if I have time, I read more medical literature. Um, do admit being up to date, uh, your third edition of the book, uh, Stefan's second edition of the book. Um, so that's that's why, why, why I try to spend my time. Wonderful. And now, Rastam, you go to so many places, right? You visit uh, different countries, you proctor different people. Um, can you tell if someone's going to be a good operator when you meet them for the first time? Can you immediately tell or it takes a while? Yes. Uh, quite often uh, when you go and do uh, proctoring, uh, the company interested about, they always ask for feedback about certain operators. Um, so, Yes, um, not everyone can do uh, complex PCI interventions, and you you can kind of uh, will know it on day one on the first interactions with the doctor, especially the first operators, the way they do it. And if uh, a doctor already advanced, uh, you know, 20 years after training, sometimes it's difficult to change. Um, and, you know, sometimes a person will have a very strong, uh, you know, a personality kind of ego, if you call it. Uh, it's very difficult to, to teach more senior. With younger people, uh, when they're just out of their fellowships, and if you see the, how keen they are in their eyes, uh, you know, and then you realize they have skills, they, then you, you think and you realize they're teachable because they're teachable and they're not teachable people. So it's very important. And uh, complex PCI is not for everyone. Um, uh, I guess with the structural, with echo, it's the same. Uh, in my first fellowship, uh, it was Radeska who 
uh, was one of the to top uh, structural. And then in Montreal, I had Nicole Piazza, and I had a chance to learn from both of them, but kind of it never interested me. I uh, And Stefan would not mind if I uh, learn a bit of structural, but it didn't interest me. So when I have a fellows, for example, now with me or in the last six years, and they kind of have interest in everything, uh, I'm a bit careful with them because, um, you know, of course I teach them, but when you realize they're not fully into complex PCI, then uh, you don't want to invest a lot of your time, effort in that, um, because it's impossible to, I believe it's impossible to be good in everything. You know, I have my mentor here, Darren Walters, who is good in everything, but it's exceptions, you know, um, especially with uh, a complex uh, PCI CCO field. And one fellow I trained over six years, he is now doing a dedicated CCO fellowship in Boston. And I'm very proud of that, actually. It's like Stefan used to say, your, your fellows is like my children. And you realize it is it is truth, actually. It's like your children. You you see how they grow. You're happy with them. You know, you teach them from the beginning. And with Shrikant, I was like one and a half years mentoring him. Of course, he would work with everyone. My dream is obviously is to select, as you mentioned, those who are very talented, who who are very interested in this, and actually train them. So they have protected time only whenever I'm in lab, they're my fellow. Like like with dedicated fellowship. We don't have it in Australia yet. We don't have CTO fellowship. We don't have chief fellowship. Partly, it probably depends on the on the amount of cases we do. We are low volume usually in Australia, um, but this is my dream to establish a CTO fellowship. Have a dedicated fellow, highly selected dedicated fellow, um, who is talented um, not only with the hands, with the brain, but also able to publish and train them for a couple of years. Kind of have a school. It's probably easy in the United States. In Canada, in Canada, it's a big center, seven cat labs, you know, everything is there, high volume. In Australia, we have labs in, uh, not in every street, but we have a lot of cat labs here, low volume. So, Rastem, you've done so many things already, and you're obviously very young, still many things ahead. What are you most proud of so far? Most proud of? Um, I guess if if we talk about uh, overall in my life, it's... it's um, Proud of my family, my kids. Um, if we talk about, um, and I'm proud to be a, a son of my father and mother. Obviously, my father was a professor um, who created the dynasty. My 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 sister is a professor in, in medicine, and her kids are doctors uh, or cousins doctors. So father started being uh, the man from uh, who born in the village. I'm the first generation in the city, um, and then. Obviously, um, what I'm doing here, um, I was lucky to uh, meet my mentors on my way. It was uh, John Horowitz and Stefan Rinfred, uh, Professor Walters. Um, kind of very important to have uh, mentors in your life. Um, and that's the, the training I, I got from them allowed me to be where I am. And I'm enjoying what I'm doing. It's very important to have great satisfaction from your work. I go to work. If it's a cat lab, I'm I'm like 100% there. I love it, and I'm I'm proud to be a doctor. Proud to uh, provide, um, you know, high complex care that was not able to be, you know, provided by other hospitals or by the surgeons because patients are too sick. And working with surgeons, I enjoy that. You know, we help them. They help us, um, and. Our specialty is evolving. It's not there yet. We, we haven't conquered everything. Uh, the new devices coming in, industry is helping us. And um, I'm proud also of, um, I guess, traveling around, uh, helping other people. Proctoring is very important. Every time you go teach somebody and then see how they grow, you come back a bit later, they, they have done a few cases. They're also proud of that. Um, yeah, yeah. Teaching is 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 very important. You kind of uh, create um, create uh, new students. You create a new interest in this specialty. Um, as we mentioned, everyone is interested in structural nowadays. It's it's like ten percent of fellows will follow you. 
and the rest will go, go to other labs where the, there is a tower and etc. Yeah, I don't know what they find interesting there. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, and you're right. I mean, the complexity-wise, the program can be can be fairly uh, fairly challenging and demanding. So, Rastam, again, you've learned from a lot of people. You've taught a lot of people. If you have to give any final advice to the fellows or people learning their careers, what would you advise them? Advice uh, early on: decide what you want to do in your uh, career. If it is complex. PCI interventions, uh, dedicate fully yourself there, uh, decide if it's, you know, something for you, is it something for your family, will your wife will go with you there, um, because uh, we have, for example, fellows whose wife will stay here and they go for one year, very limited, kind of, it's one of the best time in your life and to try to go overseas, um, don't stay in your country, like if you stay, for example, in Australia for fellowship, you won't learn much. Uh, but of course, it can be a good backup before you go and join fellowship. Like I was a kind of a first in human experiment, a CCO from zero. Uh, but of course, the fellow who came after me, Luis, for example, he had his own fellowship, then five years of uh, independent PCI work. And then joining CCO, it's like it's just upgrade. It's like I iOS upgrade, you know, versus like completely switching to to Apple phone, you know, from uh, from Nokia or something. So very important to decide early on and the second most important thing is to find a mentor you don't need to go to uh, some i don't know uh, very famous uh, american hospital center fellowship and then put a plug uh, on the wall i don't have a single plug out of my fellowships because i never received them um, it's it's finding a mentor that's what counts it's a mentor who will teach with you who will stay with you on every case um, like i had many mentors through my two fellowships but Everything I learned is from one person. Everything I do on a daily basis, every every step in angiogram and PCI. And that's what I'm teaching my fellows now. All this knowledge that I received, of course, I build up this knowledge now uh, through my own experience, then I pass on to my fellows. So it's important to find a mentor that will shape you, not the center. And then, of course, it's important to find a job because the first job, job that counts if you end up with whatever job available and then thinking, okay, two, three years later, I'll get a new one. It's not like that because, you know, you come with, with good referees and then you go to a job that has only limited lab time. You get busy in private, you know, and you just scale and people, when you refer to, uh, apply to a new job, they say, oh, you've been to this, you know, low volume job, why? And So job is very important. That's the third thing. And the fourth thing is obviously... And to uh, keep learning, yeah, it, it requires a lot of dedication. I'm talking about becoming a, a good complex PCI operator. There are so many average PCI operators, and many of them will be happy. In, in Australia, you just create income by uh, doing clinics, a bit of you know um, cases in the lab, and uh, good good kind of free time. So you can create a good lifestyle in Australia. You know, there is a beach and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you want, you know, to be a dedicated high volume PCI operator, like last year I did 520 PCIs in Australia, it's very high volume. You just require 75 uh, by the college and more, more than half of them are complex. If you want to do that, it requires dedication and um, you need to keep learning, attend conferences, um, in fact, I've never been to, for example, to Euro PCR, but I have been to ML CTO many times. Um, I, I rarely go to TCT, but I try to attend a New York CTO. So, and I try to attend any complication conference in, in the region because that's where you keep learning. There is no limit for you to learn, but you learn exactly from those dedicated CTO complex PCI chip conferences and from complications. You don't need to go, to, you know, to the major big conferences, but in your area only. And obviously, there are a lot of books, there are a lot of uh, YouTube channels, like yours, for example. Uh, um, uh, keep keep looking at the cases. You will learn everything. A lot of new things there. Wonderful. Well, again, Rastem, thank you so much. It was uh, an amazing journey through 
different continents and different languages that you went through. Thanks for sharing all this uh, piece of advice and wisdom for all of us. And again, very excited to keep on working with you uh, in the future. Thank you, Manus, for inviting Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 